Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful evening. Thank you for enabling us to meet together and to meditate on your word. We thank you, Lord, for the letter of Paul to the Romans, where we draw a lot of truths. And Lord, thank you that it also is not just helpful in the context in which it was written, but also it's helpful to us who are listening to the word. And may it, Lord, bring in fruit, may it bring in result in our lives as we meditate this today. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this today we are going to be looking at another verse um, from Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Let me just read that for, uh, for all of us. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Another translation says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. As we come here, we need to remember that this is another explanation of the sincere love which Paul talks us in verse 9. Let me just go back to verse 9. Paul talks about this. Let love be genuine. Above what is evil, hold fast to what is good. I'm just following up from verse 9 all the way to verse 16. And this is another way by which love is expressed. We need to resist temptation. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to kind of rush through this. Uh, we want to make sure that we stop, we meditate, and we just take those that would apply to our lives. So, very clearly it says that live in harmony, live in harmony with one another, not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position who will not be conceited. In the first place, we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to live in harmony? Especially those who are musically sound, but know what harmony is, and uh, you know, harmony brings so much of, you know, um, so much of joy, so much of happiness. And those who are, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a state of despair, in a state of um, suffering and going through some problems, you know, what they do is they try to listen to some good music because they feel that music brings so much of pleasing and so much of oneness, so much of harmony. And I think um, that, is, that is what brings satisfaction, or that is what brings joy. And, and at the same time, if I can ask uh, people who are having an appreciation of music, if there is one note, a rock note that is played, you know, we always have that, you know, the, uh, you know, it jars upon our ears. It is not, it is not soothing, it's not, in that joy, we see a kind of a, a sense of pain, a sense of offense. So, same way, when there is harmony in the church, and when there is fellowship in church, there is a sense of joy and well being. The same thing that we are talking about in terms of music, as the music brings in a sense of joy. As the music brings, brings in a sense of well-being, the same way your know, harmony brings in uh, a sense of joy and well-being in the fellowship of the church. And of course, the fellowship or uh, the, the coming together in the church, you know, brings or is filled with the joy of the Lord. It is not a, an ordinary joy, but it is the joy of the Lord that brings in harmony that brings in that satisfaction, that brings in that, that sense of um, 
being uh, together. So, uh, the work of God knows your screen doing, and um, and it's very much visible. Today, we see that in our own church, you know, people growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We see churches growing for the reason that, you know, there is so much of uh, joy and so much of wonder and harmony. There is so much of studying the word together. Those are all like, you know, we visibly see the transformation that happens in the church. And, uh, and, and I think one of the primary factors of a church growth or a church being, you know, growing in numbers is being oneness, you know, oneness of faith and action. And I think that is something that uh, increases, increases, you know, people to come together, people to come and together worship. And I think there is also a sense of belongingness, a sense of, uh, of, of you know, when you belong, people look forward to that. When you, when you, you know, the reason why you have how you fellowship after our worship service is that we kind of interact with one another, ask how they are doing, how is the week been, and therefore, like, you, know, you, you talk and there is so much of joy that you, you kind of receive, and you also see that there is an affirmation of, of belongingness in that conversation. We belong to one another. We belong, of course, to Christ and also one another. And so if there is a kind of discord, if there is a wrong note in the church, for whatever reason, the joy diminishes. The joy is gone. There's a sense of discreet or a sense of, you know, a, 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 a kind of a disharmony that we see. But the devil actually is very active to bring in disharmony in the church and into the fellowship of God's people. Because he knows that, you know, he brings in discord of various things, various things of various sin that can creep into the church. Uh, and, and kind of the weakness of the church is in part. The devil is very, very interested, very much interested in terms of bringing that is happening in the church. He tries to bring in this unity, he tries to bring in a lot of things. And one thing that we are going to be talking about today is also you know, bringing in the concept of pride. Bringing in the concept of pride versus humility. The causes of these thoughts are many, as I had already mentioned. However, if the members of our church are humble enough under the mighty hand of God, in submission to the scriptures, if all the members of the fellowship dwell much in scriptures and molded by the word of God, then the discord or disharmony is less likely to be found in the church. Paul talks about, you know, uh, the heart of this God and he says that, you know, as I had already mentioned, the primary reason of this God in the church is pride and conceit. Pride and conceit. Paul tells that we must not be proud or be conceited. Paul is very clearly talking about that in this verse. He says, do not be haughty. And, uh, and that is where we are now, you know, we ask, ask, he's asking us to associate with the lowly, to kind of exercise the concept of humility. Paul talks about being ready, as I said, to be associated with the low positioned people. And, and willing to be humble enough to accept the fellowship of the lowly people. Probably we might come under a, 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 a particular level of job or a particular level of family, but I think inside the church we we, we, we kind of need to understand that that is what humble means to be one, not just with or same strata of people, but with all strata of people. Of course. We can give any reasons, but ultimately, pride causes disharmony in church. Pride causes disharmony in church. We need to search that which will provide harmony in 
the fellowship or in the church. We need to kind of look forward to those things that can bring in harmony in the church. We need to understand that harmony should be considered as a characteristic of the fellowship or the church. A church, when we are calling, like saying, a more Western church, you know, it should be associated with the characteristics of the church. Humility or harmony should be one of the characteristics of the church. The church should be known for its harmony. When people look from outside, they should be able to witness that this church is a harmonious church. Not just in music, but also in, in terms of being together, being humble, being associated with different groups of people. And of course, uh, we see that uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 11, Paul is like, you know, expounding on uh, how do we kind of apply the gospel and uh, in terms of practical ways to apply the gospel. But as soon as, you know, we see that, you know, after, until chapter 11 and chapter 12 clearly talks about um, how harmony can be promoted in the church. Paul is very, you know, s taking it step by step and, and now coming up to the concept of harmony. If all people lived out the gospel and the salvation they have received in Christ, then harmony would be the result. It's a step by step process. Harmony can be achieved when every people and every congregation member lives out the gospel and the salvation they have received in Christ and apply the salvation that they have received in Christ. If the members do that, there would be harmony. Of course, we always see that there is always a fight between the flesh against the spirit. The devil is active. Um, you know, in terms of exciting the flesh in us and causes people to kind of fall from the track. Fall from the track. And that's the reason, like, you know, Paul clearly talks, right from the beginning of Romans, he talks, uh, he always talks focusing on individual people. Individual people, individual church members. We must, uh, we must take it for granted that Paul is speaking to every believer, uh, every true believer of the church. And for those who know Christ as a Savior, because I believe that all of us you know, are being washed by the blood of the Lamb, and all of us have exercised the salvation, we received the free salvation of Christ. And therefore, we are, you know, we are expected to promote harmony in the church. And, and probably, you know, at its root, all the way to the root. And all of us believers, we know that we are sinners day by day. Whatever gifts, or whatever skills, whatever talents that we have, we are still sinners day by day. We have nothing to be proud about. We can't. We can never boast about our own skills, our own, you know, because we owe everything back to Christ. Everything that we have, you know, we need to owe it back to Christ. And I think that is when we will be able to exercise harmony, exercise the humility, and fight against the pride that we have. And so as a believer, as a true believer, we need to owe everything and not be proud about our skills. And continue to live in salvation and, and grow in grace, depending completely on Christ's grace and Christ's blessing in our lives. Therefore, there's no room for pride, there's no room for conceit before God. And we need to understand that every skill is by, by the grace of God. And of course, Paul tells again in First Corinthians that the Holy Spirit gives gifts for the well-being of the church according to His sovereign will. If we have been given gifts that can be said to place us in front, then we need to appreciate these things. We need to be able to appreciate and exercise those gifts 
for the well-being of the church, not for our personal gain. We need to ensure that our skills, our talents, our resources are being used for the purpose of well-being of the church. Of course, we, I was talking to you about, we need to appreciate two things. First is that the gifts we have are from God because He has been gracious to us and that we hold them simply in trust. Therefore, of course, I can honor you. We don't seek glory for those things. It's because God has been gracious. He is a God whose character is grace, and He's been a gracious God. Therefore, He bestows us with talents and gifts. We need to understand and we need to be appreciative of the fact that we have been given those gifts because God is gracious. The second thing we need to appreciate is that the gifts are no greater in the mind of Christ than supposedly lesser gifts. We need to understand that you know, my gift is bigger than others or others' gifts are smaller than mine. No, all are equally needed. One gift is not bigger than another one. Every gift is equally needed and are important to maintain the health and the well-being of the church. And of course that produces harmony in the body of Christ. We need to also appreciate that you know the more humble we will be we, we pay, or the more humble we are, we will be able to exercise those gifts for the benefit of the church, for the, the well-being of the church. Um, Finally, I would like to just mention that, you know, we need to seek, you know, uh, do not, you know, we need to not seek the gifts for ourselves, for our personal gain. And uh, very much, you know, we need to, uh, in terms of Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5, it says, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Don't seek for yourself. Jeremiah 45, 5, it clearly says that do not seek great things for yourself. And at the same time, I'm also connecting that with uh, the parable of the banquet, the invitation to the banquet, where Jesus uh, gives a parable uh, to say that when a, when, a, when a minister calls people, invites people to his banquet, do not go and sit right at the front, because if someone would like to kind of have a place, then we may be asked to, you know, take another place by which we may be humiliated to have. So, uh, Jesus then says that, you know, if you are invited, take the lowest place, and the master of the peace will come. come and say to the, say um, that we shall, yeah, come and say, come up higher, you know, come in front, and we shall have the joy before the whole uh, company. And I think we understand this parable very much, that we need to be humble. We don't need to be looking for positions or we know de we, we shouldn't be kind of being pride about our skills. And I think um, it's that we need to be ready to humbly, humble before uh, God and humble, be uh, able to demonstrate that humility in the church. There's another aspect that I would like to talk about in terms of the humility, um, which is uh, when we talk about humility, there's also unity in that. And, the, you know, uh, uh, unity and harmony is important. I did, we did talk about harmony. But when it comes to unity, we also are, I'm trying to connect the unity and harmony in our beliefs, not just in our talents or in our personal uh, personality of, um, you know, personality. But we, I'm trying to kind of also bring in the thought of the belief system. These days, of course, there are several uh, belief systems that we can see in outside our church and sometimes to be, um, yeah, we need to be uh, not proud of that. We see that even inside the church. So much of wrong doctrines, so much of uh, doctrines that are misleading. And we may need to be having the Christ-likeness, the Holy Spirit's, uh, you know, guidance in terms of understanding that. And at, as believers, we need to come together in harmony even in terms of the belief system that we have. What did Christ teach us? Christ taught us that, you know, in John 17, the priestly prayer that we have, 
that they may all be one. Oneness, the harmony, you know, that existed between the Father and the Jesus is what, what is expected of God or Jesus and his church, his bridegroom. So we need to understand that the church has to be in harmony. Harmony in terms of ensuring that God takes the first place. Pride does not come in. In terms of making sure that we are one in thought and purpose. And I think we need to be very clearly in harmony in terms of our belief and in terms of concerning the truth, the absolute truth that we see in the scripture. And I hope God will give us the grace to be able to uh, live in harmony. As the word clearly says, that live in harmony with each other, especially inside the church and even outside. Do not be pride, do not have the pride or attitude of pride and associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And I hope God has spoken to us today in the evening to, to retrospect ourselves, to look back our lives in areas where we have been proud about different things. And I hope God will give us the grace to submit those before God. Shall we look to the Lord? Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just look up to you and we just come down and confess that we are sinners. Somehow, Lord, pride has creeped in us and we would like to, Lord, place it before you. We would love to live in harmony. As your word clearly says, help us to live in harmony. Help us to live a Christ-like uh, life. Help us to be one as you and the Father was one. Jesus, we thank you for the salvation experience that we have received. We are very confident that we will, Lord, be at yours, at, at, at you, at, with you in heaven. And we are confident of the fact, Lord, and we thank you for that salvation. Help us to work out our salvation every day. And Lord, even during the process of working out our salvation, help us to remove, Lord, help us to kind of get rid of the pride, the self-glory that we have, Lord. And I pray that we will just place it before you. We ask you that you would give us the the ability, the strength to overcome every kind of temptations related to pride. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a humble heart to be able to, Lord, say that it is all because of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide us. We thank you for today's meditation, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.